Hello and welcome to our Bible study on the Ten Commandments. I'm the Reverend Alan Sinnott, Rector of the Camla Group of Parishes in South Armagh in Northern Ireland, part of the Church of Ireland, uh, which is part of the uh, Anglican Communion. Lord, open your word to our hearts and our hearts to your word in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. It's God's Spirit who opens the truth of the faith to us. Uh, we are utterly reliant upon God, the Holy Spirit, to guide us. And we have been working our way through the Ten Commandments. We've now reached almost the end. And that commandment in uh, Exodus 20, verse 16. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbour. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbour. Let's start at the end and work backwards. Like all good theology, we do it backwards. No, we don't. But let's just start with the question, who is my neighbour? And we are familiar with that question as we are familiar with the answer. Uh, because when Jesus was asked about the, the commandments, he used what's called the summary of the law. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul and mind. Uh, and you shall love your neighbour as yourself. When they saw that he had answered well, they asked him a, a, a subsidiary question or a secondary question, which was, and who is my neighbour? And Jesus then told the parable of the Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan uh, is chosen because to the Jews, the Samaritans were the people they most disliked. The people they had a long, centuries long beef with. It went back half a millennium at least. This uh, beef they had with them. And what made it worse was they both claimed to, uh, or they both worshipped God, the only true God, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Both sets of people claimed Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, uh, but they did it differently. Sectarianism, really sectarianism and uh, there's nothing wrong with difference there's nothing wrong with difference of opinion uh, that itself i suppose in many respects is, is a given uh, in modern society but it hasn't always been a given and it hasn't always been a given in the church uh, but there's nothing wrong with difference of opinion uh, and uh, we therefore have our different uh, Expressions of Christianity. But the disunity that has come with that has led to sectarianism. So sectarianism is, is something that very often is at, at its most harsh uh, and bitter when it's uh, close up. So the Good Samaritan, Jesus picks out a really close up, harsh uh, sectarian issue. People who spoke the same lingo. Uh, walk the same streets, worship the same God, had shared ethnic and cultural backgrounds, but disliked each other terribly. I don't have to write it in big letters. We understand and know this extremely well. So who is my neighbour? The answer is every human on the planet is your neighbour. Jesus didn't say it like that. But that's what he meant. So you shall not. Bear false witness. Against anyone. Anyone. And. You see it, it can grow up. Within. Cultural. And ethnic groups. Whatever an ethnic group is. Because ethnicity. Is more about. It's mostly about culture and religion because we are all ethnically the same blueprint. We are all come from the same source. We all have the same DNA. Uh, the variance of skin colour, eye colour, uh, shapes of people, uh, shapes of features and so on uh, are later uh, developments. I don't know enough about why pigmentation in people is different 
I don't, I'm not that scientifically savvy. I'm sure I've heard about it on a documentary somewhere, but I wouldn't dare stick my toe into the water there. But we're all the same thing. We're all, you know, we're all the same flesh. Utterly, utterly, utterly the same. So ethnicity is uh, largely a modern invention uh, and, and comes from uh, a world uh, uh, largely within Europe where we sought to depend on people uh, certain traits uh, that we largely imagined defined them ethnically. It was expedient in the worst sense uh, in the centuries of mass slave culture when we, uh, not alone in Europe, but uh, along with various uh, powerhouses on the African continent, the powerhouses of Europe enslaved many, many people from Africa, many millions of people from Africa and transported them around the world as chattels. Utterly iniquitous. Utterly awful to consider. And if we could imprint on those people a version of an ethnic identity, we could define them. And when you can define somebody, you can make them, make them less than yourself. And a lot of this uh, arose uh, between the 16th and 19th centuries. It's very strong in the 19th century. And one of the downsides, you know, I'm a great believer that science has brought us a tremendous amount of good. Uh, absolutely a tremendous amount of good. But it has brought in its wake some awful stuff as well. Uh, and many of the early evolutionary scientists, and I do accept evolution utterly, uh, I think, I can sit perfectly well alongside my faith. Uh, many of the early evolutionary scientists were proponents of the most awful racism. And you don't have to, that's not me taking a, a, a fundamentalist swipe at them. It's just true. It's just a fact of history. Uh, and, that, and some of the people that became the early propon proponents uh, of eugenics and ultimately Nazism came from that school of thought. Some of it came from uh, pseudo-religious thought, bad religion, bad theology, and superstition, and just prejudice. So you put into some of these mixes, you get some terrible things. I'm talking about the scriptural view of the neighbour is all humanity. And ethnicity um, is a construct of the modern world. But we very often use our cultural identity as an excuse for not having to be, behave well towards other people. We don't have to behave well towards other people because we have, in our own view, uh, a central place in all things. So we don't have to uh, treat other people with justice or uh, in any right or proper way. And that's truly a wrong thing. This was not a foreign idea that arose among uh, the children of Israel because we're all susceptible to this. We're all susceptible to adult-headed thinking on these things. So we are not to bear false witness against our neighbour. What is false witness? It's what's being untruthful. At its core, you know, not being truthful uh, towards our neighbour. Now, we clearly take this to the courtroom, if you like, uh, but bearing witness, uh, telling the truth, uh, being honest, uh, is something that we are all called to. Jesus said, didn't just say, I am the way and the life. He said, I am the way, the truth and the life. And he is the very embodiment of all things of God. The fullness of the Godhead bodily dwells in my Lord, says St. Paul. The fullness of God dwells in Jesus. And 
Uh, he is the truth. God is truth. Jesus is truth. Uh, and Jesus speaks truth, lives truth, is truth, and is the exemplar of truth. And then we get the trick question, what is truth that comes from the man who is a foreigner to, to integrity and is a foreigner to good character, and that's Pontius Pilate. And Pilate says to Jesus, well, what is truth? Now, we all know that there are shades of understanding. But truth is truth, and we should tell the truth. That means as Al Gore said very famously, truth can be inconvenient. I love history. I'm not particularly good at history. I'm not an expert in history. But I love history. I, I love uh, finding out stuff. I love to look at Irish history. The history of this island uh, is full of tragedy and full of anguish, full of trouble and bloodshed, warfare, uh, intercommunal strife. And there are things that are held across our communities to be absolutely factual. <laughs> then when you read the flippant truth, or the, the history I should say, and find out exactly what did happen on such and such a day, in such and such a place, you find it's really, really quite inconvenient. I'll take it back beyond the Protestant Catholic thing to a time when no such distinction actually existed. The time of the Vikings, Brian Baru, High King of Ireland, defeated the Vikings at Clontarf and laid down his life and lost his life and is almost considered a religious martyr uh, in some parts of, of the thinking uh, that goes on. Brian Baru had more Vikings in his army than the Vikings had in their army. It was far more complicated. That, that doesn't suit our narrative. You know, when the Yanks are coming off the plane, we love to be there in our iron jumpers, you know, with our tin whistle and our, our, our banjo, telling them about Brian Baru, telling them about the wickedness of this set of people, that set of people, these people came and did that and so on. And when you start to read it, you get bogged down, really, because it's really complicated. Really, really complicated as to who is who and what is what and whose side who was on. And you'd be really, really surprised by some of the stuff that's there. You know, and it's really hard to get to the truth and to hold to the truth and to accept the truth. Because the truth is inconvenient and it's uncomfortable. So telling the truth is important. Jesus refers to the devil himself as the father of all lies. So we are not to bear false witness against anyone. We are to be impeccable and scrupulous in our honest dealing with people. I will not claim to be George Washington and say I cannot tell a lie. Of course I've told lies. I'm flesh and blood. Uh, I, of course I've tried to cover my tracks by, you know, muddying the truth. And we have all uh, done that. But I endeavour when I'm confronted with a big issue to be as truthful as I can. So... We are not to bear false witness against our neighbour. It's a command of God. We are to have integrity and be of good character when it comes to our dealings with the people who are around us. Uh, and we are not allowed to break this law. We are to tell the truth. We also have to be careful with the truth because we can weaponize the truth. And we can use the truth as, a, as something to berate a third party with. To beat them down and we can make people feel bad about themselves. I'll bring this down to the more local setting. And I don't mean local in the sense of the four churches in my parish here. 
I mean, the local setting that we can all identify with, uh, and I have been rector, I'm now, I think, in my fourth incumbency, as well as doing chaplaincy work, I've been rector in many different places, as well as being a curate. And I've come across the strange use of self-image in people who say, I tell the truth and you've just got to live with it. I'm a truth teller. And you just have to get on with me telling the truth. You know the sort of person who walks up to you and says, what's wrong with your face? Or somebody walks up to you and says, see you. And they give you their version of the truth. And they just demolish everybody around them. And... They say, you just have to take me as you find me. People just have to accept that that's what I'm like. There's an awful lot of that in modern society. And we really are very like that here where I live. And, and I don't mean locally necessarily. I mean, we're really like that here in, in Ulster. You know, and the first, I've lived in the west of Ireland. I've lived in the west of Ulster. I grew up in the east of Ulster in County Down and in Belfast. And uh, as you move east, the more blunt people become. As you get closer in to Belfast North Down, the more straight from the shoulder people are. Uh, and uh, it can be very wounding. It can be very funny. It can be very refreshing, you know. I moved from Fermanagh to County Antrim. And I went in to visit somebody. And I, I always struggle with my weight. My weight's on the way down at the minute. It's progressing in all the right directions at the minute uh, and I hope this to be a permanent state of affairs that I will get to a healthier place regarding my weight and I, I am definitely paying attention to it in a big way and I have been enormously overweight for a long time and it's a, a terrible fault uh, that I have you also live with people uh, who think that they can just say whatever they like to you when you're overweight and I walked into somebody's house and she said, you're, no, you're funny, you're spuds. Well, that could sound funny. It really upset me. And 20 years later, I'm still fuming, you know. I have to put my hand up. I can be like that with people. So my parishioners probably know that. Uh, and it's a fault, you know, I'm just blurt out the truth. And that blurting of truth can be a false witness in its own way because we're using truth. It, it, it may be a factual matter. Look at your man over there. Look at the size of him. But is it a good thing to go over and poke the person in the tummy and say, look at the size of you? You know? Now, that's not me being overly defensive uh, on that. Uh, I do find that people can behave, think they can behave whatever way they want in churches in a way that you wouldn't behave on the shop floor when you're at work uh, or in the police station where you would work or in the ward where you work or in the office where you work. You wouldn't dare say some of the things that people think it's okay to say in churches. Uh, and that I've seen people, I've had people pull when my hair was longer, pull my hair, pull my beard, poke my tummy. And I'm not the only one. I see it happening to other people. And that is saying a truth and just, it's like walking up to, it's like a child walking up to somebody and saying, why have you got a big nose? You know, and, you know, children are wonderful. It's about, gee, it's about eight or nine years ago, maybe even ten years ago, uh, we were back up in Newton Ards from the west of Ireland and we'd gone for Sunday dinner in Roma's in Newton Ards. I was sitting having, I think it was Sunday dinner, and there was a lady with her wee boy, a girl with her wee boy, sitting across from us. And he was only about three. He was somewhere between two and four. A very small boy. Lovely wee fella. And I was sitting there opposite. Now my beard wasn't white the way it is going now I was sitting opposite them and he looked over at me and he pointed at me and he went ho 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 <laughs> that's truth telling he thought I was Santa and it's 
just we just laughed. And such a lovely thing. Children can tell truth. When I was a child, I spoke as a child, but when I grew into manhood said St Paul, I had to leave childish things behind. You can't just walk up and berate people with the truth. And I sound as if I've been whinging about me. I haven't. I'm just using me as an example of how people think they can say whatever they like to other people. And I've seen people's lives destroyed with the truth. So because we say we tell the truth, we don't weaponize the truth. We don't use the truth as a hand grenade. We don't use the truth to, to just mash people into the ground. We use truth with grace, with love, with tenderness and compassion towards other people. Somebody may need to hear the truth. Ask yourself, is it my place, am I called to be the person to tell them that truth? Or am I assuming a role of judge and jury over that person's life? Bearing false witness about a person isn't just about going to court. That's how it was explained to me. And of course, that's important. If you go to court and you bear false witness and you uh, are responsible for somebody going to prison or losing their job or losing their reputation by something you've borne false witness to, then you have committed a terrible act of injustice towards that person. If you're caught out, you will find that the penalties for perjury are really quite draconian. Bearing false witness costs our economy billions every year in false claims uh, for insurance uh, and compensation. That's false witness. One I think that we are all very guilty of is one that is addressed very strongly by St Paul and others in the New Testament. And that's the false witness of gossip. I'm going to be cautious with this, but this is true. It happened about three weeks ago. I had a report that someone in the parish had suffered a bereavement, that they had a relative who died of COVID. Uh, but the person who told me, told me with due caution and said, I've only heard this. I said, don't worry, I'll find out about it. Uh, and I heard, I heard another version that said that the person was dying of COVID. I phoned my parishioner with due sensitivity. I can be sensitive. Only God can work like that, but I can be sensitive. And said, I've heard uh, that there, there's illness in your family circle. I'll be very careful not to identify anything. COVID wasn't anything to do with it. Nobody had died. Nobody was near death. Yet this had been told right across our parish, passed from person to person. Now that's serious. When somebody's reputation is on the line, gossip is breaking this commandment. This is the ninth of the ten commandments. And in our churches we say, I think about the Ten Commandments. I believe in the Ten Commandments. We should teach the Ten Commandments. We should live by the Ten Commandments. Then we can't bear false witness. And bearing false witness, bearing false witness is most prevalent when we pass on tittle-tattle when we gossip about people and when we gossip about people in a way that affects their reputation. 
And it's really hard not to indulge in it. It's really hard not to pass on uh, the tittle tattle. I'm fortunate in that my calling a profession requires me to deal in um, confidentiality. That anything that you tell me as your rector under under the circumstance of saying, I need to bear my soul to you, I need to confess something, or I need to talk about something very personal, that is confidential. The exceptions would be around issues of uh, abuse, uh, violence, threat to life, threat to children, and so on. Those are given. You know, if you're sitting there telling me, you know, you've got a carving knife in your hand, you're saying, as soon as you leave, I'm going to chop up the family. There's no confidentiality there. Nine, nine, nine. Can you get here as fast as you can? There's somebody going to chop up their family. You know, let's be sensible. But in every other circumstance, confidentiality is the seal of the confessional. So I've had to discipline myself and learn in the context of my work that what you tell me stops here. And uh, that's, that's been good for me to be able to do that. Am I immune to passing on gossip? Well, when other clergy get together and they start talking, I think we let it all out. And there's an old joke, not a very good joke, an old joke that says, when, you know, when you see four or five clergy standing talking together, why do they all stay so long? Because everybody knows that the first one to, to leave is the next one to be talked about. You're scared to leave the group. You know, we love to pass on the news. When I hear from a third party about one of my fellow clergy, he or she is a terrible person. I always make a note in my mind. I don't believe that. I won't believe it until I've heard it confirmed two or three times by more reputable people. So somebody comes up to me and says, my minister's like this. I just file the information. And it tells me more about the person who's given out about their minister. And we should all treat gossip like that. Who's passing on this information? Why? Are they telling you? What is the purpose? But when we slander people, and slander is when we uh, pass on an untruth by word of mouth. Libel is when you write it down. When we slander somebody and tear them apart, then we need to know that we have borne false witness. We live in a terribly dangerous time when it comes to what's known as trolling. And I have seen in my adult lifetime the rise and rise of the internet. I use the internet all the time. I chat to people on the internet. I quite like certain social media platforms, but I'm very careful about who I let in to my circle of friends on my social media platforms as far as you can be. And within those groups of people, by and large, everybody's well behaved. And if there's a dispute, it's well mannered. But you hear about the most awful, awful, awful things. And gossip and lies and all sorts of things are, are used to destroy other people. And this is why we must reinforce our judicial system. Take the trial of, I think it's Ghislaine Maxwell, uh, Jeffrey Epstein's uh, associate and friend of the Duke of York. Ghislaine Maxwell stands accused and charged of terrible crimes. She has not yet been tried for them. 
she has not yet been found guilty. Therefore, for anybody to proclaim her guilt before she is found guilty in a court of law is slander. For anybody to write it down as truth, we may say, I believe this person to be a bad person. I believe this person to be a wicked person. I believe she has done these things. And I'm not saying I believe those things or not. I will wait and see what the court says. I will wait and see what... It's called a trial because you try out, you proof test what is laid out there. It's laid out for you. And, uh, and forensically examined. Let's wait and see. Gossip can kill people. I moved into a parish once. I have to say every parish I have worked in uh, in this country there's been a paramilitary presence so you can't identify the parish particularly. I moved into a parish and I was told by a couple of people that the same two or three people were members of a particularly pernicious, violent, murderous um, terrorist organisation. Turned out not to be true. They weren't. That can get you killed in the country I live in. If you're watching this somewhere else, you're thinking, what's, what's he talking about? But that type of, that fellow over there is a member of can get you killed in the country I live in. Certainly could back then. I think it probably could now or has the potential to get you killed. That person over there is this. That person over there is that. That person there, that accusation, that those words can get somebody killed. I came across a horrific uh, report of a girl who was beaten to death, beaten to death in Kabul about four years ago because people said she had burned the Quran. And whatever we think of the Quran, whatever we think of the burning of the Quran, I don't think you should burn any book. I don't think you should burn any holy book, certainly. Uh, uh, and, uh, and dude, you've got no Quran. That's random, came into my head. You know, you can't go around doing those sort of things. She had not burned the Quran. She had not done it and she was beaten to death by a mob. Jesus was condemned to death by in, in this most extraordinarily well documented cocktail of half truths, spun truth, partic um, pol political opportunism, Curtis mob mentality and they brought false witnesses against him. In the face of the false witnesses, in the face of the mob, in the face of the political opportunism and spin, Pontius Pilate said, I find no fault in him. Now, he then proceeded to do the wrong thing because he was a, a moral coward. But Pontius Pilate said I, I, he did no wrong thing. Jesus is the, an example, is the example of bearing false witness. And isn't it interesting that in the arc of biblical truth that we go from the Decalogue, the ninth of the Ten Commandments, we go from there to the crucifixion of our Lord and he is hung on a cross in the most bitter and brutal of circumstances on the spinning of truth on the bending of truth and the bringing of false witnesses against him false witness killed our Lord false witness can kill people False witness can kill the soul. The spreading of gossip, the telling of lies, the, the harsh words that are spoken, the half-truths that are passed on. And you know something? You only need to raise an eyebrow. Oh, I him. And it can be the end of everything. See her? 
be the end of everything for people. We are not to do it. When we are people of truth, we are to tell the truth. And we're told in Scripture, tell the truth in love. To temper how we use the truth. So that all things that pass from us are beneficial and to the building up of others, not tearing down. So let us live with the inconvenience of truth, but let us be tellers of truth. And if we've got nothing good to say, say nothing. Read the letter of James again. We looked at it quite a lot earlier in the year in church. Consider the word of the Lord. Consider the truth. Consider who Jesus is. What happened to our Lord? What happens when we sow the weeds and the poison of false witness through gossip or worse to the tearing down of others? False witness is a very, very destructive thing. <clears throat> and it's in the Ten Commandments for that purpose. O oh God, you declare your mighty power most chiefly in showing mercy and pity. Mercifully grant us such a measure of your grace that we, running the way of your commandments, may receive your gracious promises and be made partakers of your heavenly treasure through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord, and blessed are those who observe and keep your law. Help us to seek you with our whole heart, to delight in your commandments and to walk in the glorious liberty given us by your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord, in the name of Christ. Amen.